Hey, I'm back. It's Sean Kidney. I'm CEO of the Club Bonds Initiative, in case you didn't know. And I'm here today to introduce a panel to moderate a session on pool, growing it right, green, social and sustainable, sustainable bonds in the US, which we think is the next geyser about to go. I mean, there's been quite a lot of bonds in the US. You'll hear a little bit about it as Caroline Harrison, one of our speakers, speaks in a minute. You will know that we now have extraordinary, impressive, positive, necessary climate targets in the US of 2030 cuts of 50%. And you've finally got a president explaining what's going on. We heard President Biden yesterday talking about how Hurricane Ida's severity in New York, in Queens, was part of climate, was about climate change and people need to understand, need to react, need to prepare for this. So things are changing, the narrative is changing. But what we're most interested in is green bonds. Globally, green bonds are growing like gangbusters. We've got about 1.5 trillion outstanding. We think we might even get to the 2 trillion of green, social and sustainable this year. I've been pushing for a trillion dollars a year for a few years. We missed my target of last year. We might get there next year. Let's see. Subject to the US market, which is why we've got this session today. Look, I need to start off by saying thank you to our sponsors. As you know, these things only happen with the support of folks who are uh, allowing us to put together the agenda, the excitement, the energy of these, this week-long conference. But more to the point, what we've discovered in our conversation with the sponsors, the extent to which these institutions have moved on. You know, my interview of Chuko Amuna yesterday from JP Morgan, it was a discovery. You know, this is a bank which has been criticised a lot for its fossil fuel lending in the past, is now engaging for all its customers, including its fossil fuel customers, about what the transition leads to look like. Hurrah! Or Val Smith from City speaking on Monday. Same business, same interesting with an ex CEO saying amazing things. Hurrah! It feels like the change is really underway. These institutions, like Credit Suisse, like Moody's, Luxembourg Green Exchange, and Ping An, who's the sponsor of today's event, are organisations that are pivoting to try and affect the change. Now, don't get me wrong, no one's perfect. We've got to keep pushing while we celebrate. That's our job in this community, to, to cheer from the rooftops when things are going well and to say, hang on, that isn't quite right, work on that. That's what we keep doing. But they're here. All of these sponsors are here. BNP Paribas Asset Management, IDB, ICMA, Ashurst and so on. They're here because they're committed to growing this market, like our panellists that are about to come through. A bit of logistics. You know these things. There's a Q&A box of questions. Ask. There's live interpretation. Look for the headphone icon. Uh, and look, it's Portuguese, Spanish, Mandarin and French. And tomorrow we're adding Japanese. So be prepared. All sessions are recorded. You can keep on listening. You can, when you go walking the dog or going for a jog. And there are, the networking tools are cool. Try them out. And if you're media, hey, tell us. We want, to, we want to organize interviews with you. Our speakers today. Look, we've got Karen Kitty, who's the treasurer of Stanford University who is the person who organised the issuance of a certified climate bond just recently for 315, 315 million, I think, Karen, if I've got the figure out. You'll, you'll correct me in a minute. Uh, this is an exciting new development. And we, they've been followed recently by Oberlin College that have also issued a green bond, a very successful one. We'll talk about that. Stephen Liberatore, who's uh, Managing Director, Head of ESG and Impact uh, for Global Fixed Income at Nuveen which is, uh, grew out of the old TIA CREF, for those of you that, that have some history here. Stephen's been a pioneer, a, a cheerleader for this market for as long as I've been in the space, that's for sure. Erin Bigley, Allianz Bernstein. We love Allianz Bernstein. We've had this relationship for ages where they have been really pushing the needle from the investment side about how things need to change and investment opportunities so Aaron's a senior vice president, a fixed income senior investment strategist. And then John Houston, who's portfolio manager at Fidelity Social and Governance Investing at Fidelity Investments. We're talking about Fidelity Investments, an elephant. Thank you, John, for joining us today. Um, we've got a, a little cameo appearance at the end by Paul O'Connor, 
who's head of EMEA ESG Dead Capital Markets. He's a green bonds guy from JP Morgan. Uh, a few words. But we're going to start off with Caroline Harrison, who's a senior researcher, who is our special senior research analyst at uh, Climate Bonds Initiative, who did was the lead author for our USA report that you'll probably plug, but you can get that on our website anyway, and who also, by the way, is the lead author for our Green Bonds Pricing Report. And boy, if you haven't read that, you do not understand the market. That was that was yesterday's session. Have a look at that in your in your app. Caroline, please give us a few facts and figures. Thank you, Sean, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of slides to set the tone uh, of this discussion, and then I will hand back to the panel. Um, so far this year, 64 billion US dollars uh, worth of green, social and sustainability debt has originated from the USA, which is already 80% of the prior year total. Two thirds of that amount was green bonds, but social and sustainability bonds continue to grow. And in fact, thanks to issuance from local authorities, volume of social bonds has already exceeded that of 2020, suggesting that this market has great potential. Next slide, please. Cumulatively, the, the USA is... Huh? Pushing the button. <laughs> Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. I'm your beautiful assistant. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, cumulatively, the USA is the most prolific source of green bonds uh, and uh, social and sustainability combined. Essentially, though, that is because of the green label debt, uh, which stands at $265 billion to date. One single issuer, Fannie Mae, is responsible for 36%. Uh, of the green debt from the USA. And without that contribution, the USA would be in third place after France and China. So just to scale the contribution of Fannie Mae, which is uh, $96 billion at the moment, um, if it were a country, it would be similar in size to the Netherlands, which has issued 98 billion of GSS debt. And the third and my final slide, thank you, Sean. Um, earlier this year, as Sean has already alluded to, we published our uh, first North American state of the market GSSS debt report. Um, and we noted a few things that could be done to help to grow the market, which essentially uh, is the purpose of this session today. So first and foremost, and something that I personally care very deeply about, is uh, that the USA must issue a green treasury, which I am going to call the green tea. So we need green tea. Uh, this will help to set precedent in the market and uh, bring scale and attract investment and generally assist with green market creation. Secondly, we need a broader range of issuers to engage a higher number of high profile um, investors. Thirdly, whole entity transition plans uh, are needed to enable participation from a broader range of sectors. So no entity must be left behind in the transition to the low carbon economy. And we must develop ways uh, to enable that to happen. Fourthly, benchmark size deals with adequate transparency will help to get the market going by attracting dedicated investment mandates, such as those uh, managed by some of our panel members and in addition to that, larger deals attract investors from all sources because they are included in broad, mark bench, broad market benchmarks. Uh, hence, all types of investors who use those benchmarks uh, have to consider uh, these green social and sustainability deals if they are large enough. The fifth point uh, is that repeat issuance brings scale economies for all stakeholders and uh, repeat issuance is essential to ensure a steady pipeline of green, social and sustainability debt. And finally, um, clear, accessible and consistent pre and post issuance reporting supported by wider use of third party reviews will support investor confidence in the credibility of the GSS themed market. Uh, that concludes this very short presentation, and I'm going to hand back to Sean, who will now interrogate the panel uh, on their experiences and thoughts on these topics. Thank you, Sean. 
Thanks, Caroline. And by the way, it is a great report, worth a read. Aaron, I'd like to bring you in first. Uh, we've, so, we've spoken about green bonds. You're the one who told me about liquidity benefits and the crash in March of last year. Broadly speaking, what's, what are you hearing? What's the opportunity? Do you think this is going to grow? What are your reflections on the US market? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, and and we've loved our partnership for a long time as well here at AB with CBI, so let me say that. Um, as I was reflecting on this panel, uh, and this panel is focused on the U.S. market, but it was really helpful for me to reflect on the similarities and the differences in the green and, and social sustainable bond markets globally. And what we see is more of a maturity in the European bond market, particularly in some of the things that Caroline was just mentioning, higher standards in terms of bond frameworks and second party opinions and, and reporting. Um, in the US, we definitely see plenty of room for improvement there. For example, in the muni market where reporting is not great. Bonds often don't have formal frameworks nor second party opinions or certifications. We need to see much more diversity of issuers within the US uh, and different corporate sectors across the risk spectrum. But I would also say that on the bright side, we are seeing innovation. And as different issuers come to the market, we're seeing some really interesting structures like a recent municipal issuer from a sewer authority in New York State. And they tied their green use of proceeds, building out green infrastructure to incentives for hitting the targets. If they meet the infrastructure target build out, they can call their bond at a much more attractive price than if they don't. Or uh, a recent green issue from a US energy company that had a really innovative structure. It was a green bond, but earmarked to build out renewable energy capacity. And then also attached to it was a 25 basis point coupon step up if they don't report uh, on how they've allocated the proceeds and their impact in two years. We like that. And that's a really important aspect in our view of growing the market, you need consistent reporting and data. Data and technology are key for bond investors at Alliance Bernstein and across the industry. We've got reams and reams of data on yield, on duration, on credit quality. We need more standardization and codification of ESG metrics in order to grow this market more meaningfully. For example, you know, standard key performance indicators for every green bond category. You know, how much CO2 are you saving for renewables or, or green buildings? So that this can get aggregated into a whole portfolio view, just like we aggregate an overall portfolio yield. Um, our portfolio manager teams need that, and I, our clients are also requesting it. And I think that's going to be critical because we want these bonds to increasingly find their way into all mainstream bond portfolios. We would love our flagship strategies, core strategies, high yield strategies to have higher and higher allocation to green bonds. And getting those green bonds in meaningful size into those portfolios is gonna be key to growing this market, but we need more innovation structures, more issuance and more data in order to get there. More data, fantastic. I've just come off doing a panel of Amazon Web Services about data for the green bond market. And, and tomorrow we'll be airing an interview I recorded with John Morton, counsellor to Janet Yellen, which is all about, uh, well, a chunk of it. He's saying they're going to do more work on data. So I think the administration's listening, but of course it's the, it's the, the, the commercial ecosystem that's got to provide most of this data. But one thing you didn't touch on, which I'm going to ask John about, John, if I can call you in, is Caroline kind of thumped the table and said, we've got to see a green tea bill. She was... Uh, she was pretty strong about that. Um, give us your reflections and also tell us if that's likely or whether she's barking up the wrong tree. Over to you anyway, John. Thanks, Sean. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, and thanks for uh, inviting us to join the conversation today. The, uh, well, the quick answer is I don't have insight into the, uh, the uh, you know, what the Treasury may do in terms of their strategy on uh, the green tea that Caroline said, but the um, it would be logical, given the investment programs that are being considered by the US Congress currently on infrastructure and green infrastructure. What we've seen in the market development so far is that the kind of um, 
thoughtful program that Erin was describing in some of her issuers at the local level or at the company level also makes sense at the sovereign level. And so as we've seen with other sovereign um, issuance in the green market, once there is a framework for dealing with the climate stability issue and a related investment program, a green issuance becomes one of the implementation items. So, you know, it's it's obvious it, it's a it seems like an inevitable and a very logical development. But um, I have no, you know, I haven't talked to anyone in Treasury about what their plans are on it. The uh, the other point I'd like to make is that uh, really. This comes down to, and Aaron touched on this as well, alignment with investors is really the critical issue in the development of, the, of, of, of growing it right. And so it's really number six in Caroline's uh, list of, of key issues. And for us, client preferences are the key foundation piece for growing the market. We did a survey last year uh, of retail investors and ask them what they expect of ESG uh, investment strategies. And the top response of 70% was that they expect positive environmental or social or governance, whatever the financing is, they expect to see that impact. So really that's the foundation. That's the client expectation is really the foundation for growing the market. Uh, other uh, you know, uh, opinions that came through the survey were that over 70% of, of investors, while they wanted that positive impact, they were skeptical of claims about positive impact. And so 50% uh, were concerned about whether they would get transparency into the impact. And so um, the, a similar percentage wanted to see evidence of the ESG impact over time from their investments. So when you put those um, samples of investor opinion together, it really speaks to number six on the growing it right, that um, in order to build the market, we need to go back to the investors and what they expect, what their needs are, what they're, where they're coming from. And to grow it right, we're going to need the kind of data that Aaron was talking about in order to be able to answer those questions and to uh, be able to give that transparency to the end investor, to the customer, so that they see that their investment is not only giving them the fixed income factor exposure that they may want, uh, whether it's a short duration, long duration, investment grade or high yield, but they can see also that they are getting the, um, the investment is doing what it purports to be doing. So the transparency side and standards around that and improving that are a critical piece of the function. Um, so thank you. And I wasn't expecting any inside knowledge of the green tea bill. And also you wouldn't be allowed to, to tell me anyway, otherwise you'd be arrested by someone. So, <laughs> so but hey, let's put it out there as an idea. Uh, Stephen, Stephen, We've been having this conversation about standards and about what's needed in the market for, I don't know, a long time. You've been very loud, consistent a voice in this market about the need for growth. Tell us your reflections about where we are and what's happening. Yeah, th thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. And, and, and thank you for calling me old in the nicest possible way. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, I think, you know, the, the good thing is, is that we continue to see growth and diversification. I think that we're, we're certainly going to hit your target next year of a trillion. I, I think there's really an outside chance that we're going to see a trillion of labeled issuance this year, um, you know, depending upon how the rest of the year kind of unfolds. There's, a, there's an outside chance of hitting, it, especially with the growth we've seen on, on social bonds. I, I think that the real positives of the market have been, you know, the continued diversification that we have seen in the market, you know, kind of alluding to a little bit to what Aaron was saying, you know, we see a lot of diversification, you know, we're looking to today at, you know, a situation where, you know, you and I first talk, started talking about this over a decade ago, where, you know, we hadn't even had a labeled issuance yet. And, you know, or more than a decade ago now, we hadn't even had a labeled issuance yet. Um, but it, it, when we started, you know, the first few years, you know, kind of your marginal issuer was a super sovereign that was, you know, coming at, you know, swaps minus five and, and the impact was really somewhat 
um, mitigated from the investor because you were really giving that capital to the super sovereign to invest. And so you were, you were disjointed a little bit from as an investor from the actual end impact. You know, where we are now is, you know, a, a tremendously different market where we see rapid growth across pretty much every fixed income sector. We especially like seeing the things, um, you know, develop that we have in the structured space, especially around CMBS, where you're looking at lead and bream certified pr uh, products or projects. You look at structured securities, you know, especially in the U.S., um, you know, which is a little more of a friendly environment for structured, where you're looking at, you know, securitization of distributed solar. Um, you have, you know, pay securitizations. You have a variety of different structures that allow you to get access to, you know, direct and measurable outcome, which I think is critical for from an impact perspective. You also see pretty rapid growth in the muni market. And, and yes, you, you occasionally have to work with them a little bit more on trying to get the reporting that you need and the data you need. But I think what it ultimately shows is that ultimately that, that we're still in a place where engagement is still critical, both with investors and with issuers. You know, we spend a lot of time uh, on team speaking with issuers and underwriters. You know, we, we had four, 84 engagements last year, we've already had 107 this year. And, and while we're doing that, what we're trying to get across is our view of, of the way the market should develop and putting in our, our opinions and, and what we're gonna wanna see in the structuring of a transaction for us to participate. And, and we are very much use of proceeds based. You know, we think that the key really is the ability to direct capital to specific outcomes that are measurable from an impact perspective alongside first and foremost, being able to generate positive long-term results. And that's really the key. So again, maybe building a little bit of John's points around the transparency, you know, for us, we need that impact measurement. We produce a pretty thorough impact report on an annual basis for all the strategies that I'm managing because we know that our investors are looking for that. So the engagement we're having with our investors is coming through the form of this impact report because we know they want to see how their capital is being deployed. And one of the more underreported or, or less discussed topics, I think, around why ESG and impact has grown so rapidly is because I think at this point in time, it's almost a purest form of, of an investor being able to control how their capital is being deployed and how it's being used. And in our case, we're attempting to take that capital, generate long-term excess return, but also lower costs of capital for issuers, projects, types of technologies, pools of assets that have that direct and measurable social and or environmental outcome associated with it. And we know that's kind of the double bottom line that our investors are looking for. And that's really the critical factor is being able to, I think, ultimately engage with both issuers, relaying to them what we're looking for and our investors, allowing them to tell us what they're looking for and be able to be an advocate for them. And, and for us, again, the use of proceeds methodology is really the best from the perspective of meeting that particular goal. Fair enough. And, and every investor has a slightly different approach about it. And I'm conscious that uh, uh, Aaron was talking about SLBs. And, you know, I think yep. our view at, at um, Climate Bonds, SLBs are early. They need a bit of work, a bit of shaping. But it's interesting. And I guess if we added more... Absolutely. And if we added more rigour to the SLB market in terms of mm -hmm. understanding, you're likely to jump in at that point, aren't you, if you have greater confidence. Have I got that? Have I read that right? Yeah, I think that's right, Sean. I think, again, it, it, this is another form of the engagement issue, right? Theoretically, I, I think there is something to the SLB concept. You know, I think the execution, in our view, has been very lacking to date. So the, the real focus, again, is ultimately the investor is going to decide. But through this engagement, we want to be able to explain to our investors and to any investor what our approach is. And I think that's the most that that's a, a critical factor is laying out, being able to be concise and clear about what it is to expect from investing in you know our particular strategies, and we want our investors to be able to experience that and understand that and allow them to make a decision around what really works for them, because we know that different investors are going to have different views. So there are some that are going to be okay with the concept of, of sustainability linked in the way they're currently structured. And those investors need to be able to find those particular strategies that work for them, but also for those that may not share those views and view more of, of the market currently as where we are, then we want them to be able to, to be clear in understanding what it is they're going to be seeing held within our portfolios if they choose to invest. 
And, and again, it's, it's an evolution and, and hopefully we continue to evolve over time. But I think that at, at this point for us, you know, the use of proceeds is the most, the most beneficial way to deliver both excess return over time, but also that direct and measurable outcome that we know our investors are looking for. Great. Uh, for our listeners, on Friday, we'll be launching a paper about entities, how you assess entities, which we hope will contribute to the thinking around SLBs and how to make, how to provide more rigour to it. So keep an eye out for that. But back to use of proceeds, I want to switch to Karen, who has done a use of proceeds bond, or at least her institution has done one at Stanford University. Talk about that experience. But Karen, I've got to disclose something to the audience. You know, when we met, I said, Whoa, that's a treasure I'd like to have. She's fantastic. And I'm lucky because she's agreed to join the Climate Bonds Initiative board. It's not quite a treasurer, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool for us. So we are incredibly thrilled to have you join our board. But I'm going to say for the market, we're incredibly thrilled that you had a really successful bond issuance when you went to market a little while back. Tell us about your story and the investor reaction. And, and of course, you've heard the investors speak today, your reaction to their comments. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, thank you for having me today and really happy to be here at this you know, important event um, and also to join the board of this, um, um, this, this great advocacy effort in, uh, in, in, in terms of climate resiliency and sustainability. So um, as you mentioned, I'm the treasurer at Stanford University, which is a large research university and academic medical center uh, located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, just to give you an idea of scope, um, in terms of some of the numbers that Caroline was throwing around, we're, we're, we're small. Um, we have a $5 billion long-term debt portfolio and we issue pretty regularly in both um, the muni and corporate markets uh, and are AAA rated. Um, earlier this year, as you mentioned, Sean, um, we issued a dual verified ESG bond, which we understand to be the first ever bond with both climate and sustainability labels um, in our sector. So we were, we were pretty excited about that. But what was important to me, and I think this ties to some of the threads that um, you know, um, my co-panelists have been talking about, what was important to me as we, as we decided to take this route was that our financing built upon and reflected a broader set of institutional values um, and commitments around sustainability. So it was really part of a bigger picture, driving towards key um, greenhouse gas emission targets, as well as other sustainability objectives, particularly in the social domain across the whole institution. Uh, Stanford's been especially focused on climate resiliency through clean energy infrastructure for some time, but it was really not until I read, and this was earlier this year, um, our annual sustainability report that a light bulb went off for me as to the breadth and the magnitude of the impacts of all the sustainability investments that we were making. And really it was the availability of this information internally to me, um, really a voluntary disclosure, that gave me the platform and opportunity to, to walk the talk. Um, and extend a holistic approach into our capital financing. So, you know, moving on to the standards, um, we elected to seek external second party verification of our issuance and use of proceeds under both climate and sustainability standards. Um, and we did this partly because we were new to the sustainability finance space, but also to underscore the integrity of the assets and the enabling programs that were being financed with these ESG labeled proceeds. I do believe, as you know, my co-panelists have said, that investors, ESG investors are interested in, and aligned with real measurable sustainability impacts. Um, and I agree that you know, in that vein, the development of standards and accompanying robust disclosure that supports real comparable analysis of impacts is really vital to growing the market right. But I would also say that, you know, for an issuer, we need to walk a very fine line with disclosure, um, given that the current ACC regulations are focused on um, disclosure of issues of financial materiality. So, you know, while there's a lot of work that's been done in on ESG frameworks, SASB, TCF, D come to mind, um, I think there's still a lot of work ahead to rationalize those in a way that makes sense across different entities 
um, which may have very different businesses and geographies and are faced with different ESG risks. So for now, we at Stanford um, are focused on building the internal infrastructure that will enable the collection of the data, and the meaningful data that we've been talking about today um, on our journey to net zero for scope one and two emissions by 2030 and to net zero for one, two and three um, by 2050. I think data, data is critical, but um, you know, there are a lot of institutions that a lot of work needs to be put into building the um, capacity to, to collect that data and then to report out on it in a meaningful way. So we need to tell everyone around the world in the service revision area, help us folks, bring the data to market and not just the affinities on Bloomberg's, but all the environmental services and environmental data aspects and the building criteria. You know, Fannie Mae is desperate to get energy efficiency data out of the Energy Star Scheme, EPA's Energy Star Scheme. It's not available. We need a bit of data liberation work by the administration here um, going forward. So spot on, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for that. So what I'd like to do now is ask you a little bit more on transition and what you're seeing happen. I mean, the appetite for that. As you know, a big theme of our work at Clumpons now is preparing frameworks so we can better understand transition. In some of the invested conversations I've had recently, they've been saying that the decarbonisation pathways they've been committing to can be a little problematic if they want to invest when they have confidence in a company that might be high carbon now and will be low carbon if they deliver their transition plan. Is this a challenge in doing this or is this actually not a problem? This is just a matter of rethinking metrics. I'm just curious about the issues you're facing around grappling with this issue of transition and your appetite for those kind of essence and, and I suppose also what you want to see in terms of the data to, to have confidence. Maybe Erin, kick us off on this question. Sure. Um, so appetite, yes, definitely appetite for transition. If we want more capital and if we want to meet decarbonization goals, we need more capital going towards these decarbonization projects and transition projects. And that is where I think SLBs can come into play. So sustainability linked bonds may be ideal for those issuers who are earlier on in their transition and have to make that transition. And so they can set those pathways, that, that KPI of where they're going to, even if they perhaps don't have um, the greenest business at the moment. And so I think... We've got a freeze. Erin, we might, we might hold back and come back to you while we try and figure this out and go to John to, for comment on this question while your connection re-establishes itself. Have a go, John. Hey. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and then Erin uh, comes back online. Uh, uh, she can finish her thought. The yep. um, yes to transition, and the but the issue you know goes right back to number six. If you're going to invest in transition, and say you have a green bond from a very brown issuer, the question is: Is this a sideline or is this a direction? Is this a program? And so uh, the climate uh, investment targets that we need in order to stabilize the climate require an immense amount of investment by entities that currently have high carbon uh, footprints. And so uh, if we want to have green bonds by brown issuers, and uh, the question is sorting out who, who's doing it as a sideline and who's doing it as a core strategy. And so, that comes back to the disclosure issue. And um, uh, I'll make one more point to build on that and connect how the two are related. Um, you know, we have a lot of systems to incorporate all the data. So we have a pretty good sense of the, of the data in the space and, and very strongly agree with Steve's comments um, on that. And the, uh, if you look at just the CBI database, 
of what's being done out there, and there's over 3,000 or, or more bonds in the database, there's 900 that have no SPOs. Uh, there is uh, hundreds uh, or at least uh, scores that have uh, insufficient information in order to uh, be able to understand what's going on. Uh, or uh, some of the comment fields in the database are proceeds to working capital unclear. And so if you look at the commentary in the CBI database for why bonds haven't received a climate aligned designation, it goes right back to the disclosure issue. So to finish the thought, the transition is what we are about. That's what we're trying to do. And if an organization has a overall framework and it's formulating targets and the green bond or an SLB have an important part to play in that overall framework, that really, and there's the transparency to understand what's going on, then the investors can do their job in, 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 and make the decisions. The last thing I, I, I would say is, uh, Karen mentioned about the immense amount of work that has to be done. And our colleagues on the issuance side have really um, the hardest job in building this market because I was at a forum at um, MIT Sus Sustainability Institute had a forum on these issues. And there was a, a, a manager from a large pharmaceutical company and he was describing his, he got the mandate from senior management to build the information system so they could report their climate impact and their greenhouse gas emissions and, and all the rest. And he described going from factory to factory and working with the individual managers to try and build the system to be able to give adequate reports. So in some ways it's easier for the investors to say, hey, I want good information, but we should remember that getting that right information usually involves an immense amount of work as Karen pointed out. And Karen, seeing as um, John's given us the segue to you, can you tell us a bit more about that work? You, you've got sustainability reports. You've said that was a starter for you. But does that mean, because of what has been quite a successful bond issuance for you, you're looking, you're hunting for more information? You can see more information? How's this playing out in terms of potential future issuance and also, you know, transitions in the sense of stuff that's happening now that um, you might want to allocate capital to? Well, tell me about how it's working for you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm going to I'm going to echo what John was um, saying about entity um, direction. I, I, you know, I think that's critical and the, the financings for us really are part of that bigger picture. Um, I mean, right now we 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 have excellent um, structures in place and, and data collection. We've been, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've been reporting on clean energy um you know for for quite some time 2006 i believe um next year we hope to be in terms of our own transition um entirely um sourcing our electricity from renewable sources which you know 100% which is which is which is pretty impressive and and far um in excess of california's already uh pretty aggressive standards but i you know where where we so we a lot of the a lot of the work around collecting um, climate related data is in place. I think really where the challenge comes for us is is around um, the supply chain um, and scope three and what that means, you know, um, in our particular environment. So that's what we're we're focusing a lot of attention right now internally on um, developing criteria, metrics, ability to gather data um, to enable that. And I think that will just feed into, you know, potential um, future financings um, in terms of enabling our disclosure to be even more transparent. Fantastic. And we've got Aaron back. <laughs> so, uh, Stephen, hold tight, tight. I want to come to you and ask you about collective action in a minute. Aaron, I'm we were so disappointed lost, we lost you because you're in the middle of a great riff. Do you want to do you want to dive back in? Yes, I I don't know where what else you might have covered while I was yeah, off. Just give it a shot. Okay, 
Uh, so what I was basically saying was, yes, we're all for transition financing. We like to do that via SLBs. We think that's a great way for uh, browner companies, perhaps earlier on their journey to decarbonization uh, or net zero to, and, and those perhaps that don't have enough green projects, um, but those that can set some overall corporate targets. Uh, we think SLBs are a great way in short to try to finance transition. But I was fully acknowledging that your points and Stephen's points that this is early days, structures are weak and structures are credible. And so you've really got to do the research and dig into the structures. You do not just want to be buying a basket of these, uh, every single one that comes to market, you've got to really do the due diligence and find those structures that have a, a KPI that is truly material to the industry, um, one that is ambitious and a penalty or step up that's actually material for the investor as well. Good points. Okay. We, 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 I just wanted to move to a different topic now, and I'll, I'll ask Stephen about this, which is this issue of collective action. So, you know, on the equity side, we've seen internationally the growth of coalitions like Climate Action 100 Plus and Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance and so on, which are engaging of companies to do more. And then, of course, recently we saw the famous Exxon shareholder vote uh, and so on. So this business on the equity side of engagement is getting stronger. But we haven't seen a lot on the bond side. Now, I'm not not talking about the negative side, the engagement with the Exxons. I'm actually talking about how we encourage more issuance, how we talk to government about more par coming to market. And, you know, I liken this to we can all manage our own portfolios, but we could end up being like shuffling the deck chairs in the Titanic while the Titanic keeps heading towards the iceberg <coughs> unless we can shift the ship. Do you think there's more opportunity now, more appetite now, especially if a new administration and not the same ugly Labor Department rules that were that were in the past for investors to work more closely together with states like California, New York or Illinois with the administration on how we do this and how they create investments that you can invest in? What's your reading? Yeah, I think that that's a, a good point, Sean. I think that that's, again, you know, unfortunately going back and reinforce kind of the concept around engagement and, and being consistent in approach and, and being able to communicate what it is you're looking for. And I think it, it starts, you know, at the investor and the asset manager level, right? And, and the asset owner level. It, there has to be a consistent view and a consistent approach about what we want to see develop in the market in order for that market to truly become fulsome. And, and I think the more people, you know, in, in aggregate, you know, the more individuals talking about climate issues, talking about social inequity, things of that nature bring about the conversations you want to have happen because then you're able, you know, it's, it's the argument about you can't fix what you can't measure. And so being able to have a consistent view and a consistent theme and being willing to take the time to engage and, and speak to issuers, speak to underwriters, speak to, you know, various industry working groups, speak to regulators and provide those views is really critical. And that, that's kind of the bigger picture. I think the the smaller picture, right, and, and the, more, the thing that's probably more, you know, readily available to all of us, especially on the asset management side, is the willingness to think differently about our approach and what it is we're trying to get accomplished. We need to be willing to look at smaller, more unique transactions to, to create that initial funding profile and that additional funding momentum to create more opportunities to find unique, you know, unique issuers that are providing the solutions to these particular issues that we're talking about. And, you know, it requires us to think differently, I think, on our side. And we have to be able to, to view it differently in order to engage more effectively. You know, and, and I'll just quick comment on the transition topic you just had. You know, one of the ways that I think that that could be really positive from a transition concept is, is, in, is incorporating these views. And, you know, I've spoken to every major EMP company in the world about how do we get funding out of your renewables business? Because all of them now have major renewable operations, whether it's onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, geothermal, some even have hydro. 
And to me, the, the concept of transition is a very high bar. And what we really need to be able to think of is how do we, you know, transition means to change. And, you know, when you think of like the EMP company, for example, like we want to be able to show the opportunity to finance and grow and fund their, at the moment, renewables business, which is an alternative to their main operations, but would allow them to see the path forward to transition away from what is a finite business, which is fossil fuel extraction, to one that has a longer, more sustainable path in the future for them and their shareholders. So it, it is, again, a, the engagement. It's working with as many groups as possible, but being consistent in the approach and ensuring that you're getting the views out there that can be applied and be utilized from both the investor side and the issuer side. So, so there's work we could do together to, I mean, I'm talking now in the buy side, the in fund manager and the asset owner industry, if you like, to try and push these changes and push report. I need to just check in, John and Aaron, any comments around this issue? Prospect for collaboration on these issues? Maybe John to begin with? You're on mute, my friend. It's uniquely uh, an area that... Um you know, calls out for engagement and, and collaboration. And so that, uh, you know, uh, as Steve said, is a, uh, an everyday aspect of this. And the, what's really uh, important is that we do this with a spirit of collaboration because uh, we, in the US entities, while the green bond market is still developing, the environmental practices of some of our leading institutions, whether they're on the uh, the company side or the uh, educational side or other nonprofit side, um, there's an enor enormous amount of good innovation going on. And so when we do our engagements with uh, company managers, we're very often learning from them as they are figuring out the difficult work of how do you collect from uh, you know, a set of factories or a set of operations, the data that they need to report, uh, what's the strategies for transforming that industry. And one of the roles we play very often is uh, companies often say to us, uh, how are we doing compared to the others in our industry? And uh, what else are you seeing? Because they're very, very busy on their own plans and, and implementations, and they're very interested to hear one other source of feedback about what else uh, people are doing to innovate in this space. Um, you know, there's, there's still some opinion out there, um, uh, you know, that, as Steve said, that um, maybe this is uh, uh, an insurmountable challenge, but most companies we talk to uh, feel that they can walk and chew gum at the same time, that they can become environmentally more advanced, particularly with respect to the climate issue, uh, and, and continue to grow the business in the right way. So I think it's um, the engagement is, is part of a very broad process where, as investors and as issuers, we're figuring out this way forward together. Aaron. Totally agree with with the comments raised by my colleagues. The only thing I would add just to highlight um, how how interested people seem to be in the appetite for collective action. And we we have the benefit of having um, bond and, and stock analysts. So we we engage together quite a bit with companies. But then we created a partnership um, with another university, uh, Columbia, to do a, a climate school and and, and I think in addition to engaging and talking to companies, we also need to make sure that the investment community is educated on climate risk and opportunities as well. And that has been a, a great opportunity to raise the bar on investor knowledge. There were about a thousand people that attended um, our session. And so the appetite I think is there for climate knowledge, collective climate learning, and then collective action. So I agree. So we've got, we've got a chance now, I'm gonna to say to Karen, I've got to ask Karen, uh, would you do you welcome this, or does it make you a bit nervous as an issuer before all the buy side starting to gang up on this issue? What's your reading? Uh, and this is for every issuer, potential issuer out there. How do you re how would you react? I, I I welcome the engagement, but I I think you know I'm I'm fortunate that I come from a 
an institution that's already on the you know sort of the the leading edge of this um so i think we're well situated um that may not be true in all cases Okay, folks. So there's a lot of work to do on the issuer side. Uh, and there is a lot of work to do this year. And in fact, I want to ask you about that question, because one of the conversations we had very early on and when we started talking was how you had spoken to some other issuers and I, I think prospective issuers in the Californian market. And you were surprised that there wasn't a lot of connection, if I, re if I re read the comments correctly, understanding the market. Just in the California situation, tell us about the need for education and what you heard as you started talking to others about your very successful bond? I, I'm going to use myself as a, you know, case in point. Um, we, we thought about issuing green before. Um, I was always a little worried about, um, you know, the issues around greenwashing and it just being a marketing device. So again, it was very important to me that, you know, this was built on a, um on 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 a program and on assets that had integrity and impacts um and i i think there there is a lack of knowledge in general around um in, in the financing space certainly on on the issuer side um around what the options are um or, you know labeling um i I spoke with Google, um, you know, early in our uh, in our journey, and they issued recently um, a five billion dollars sustainability labeled bond, but they were not aware of the climate bond um, label. So I think there is a quite a lot of work to do around, um, you know, marketing the, um, the, the marketing of the integrity of this market. So what's your advice? Rap, final comments, Karen. What's your advice to people listening going forward as an issuer who's done it? What would you tell someone else looking at the idea, considering it? Um, I would say, I mean, for us, as our, as our first time in the market, I think it was very valuable to get the second party opinion. Um, it helped us think about... Um, you know, what was important to investors. It was a bridge in a way um, to investors. So at least for us, that was, that was important. And I, I would, you know, I would suggest that, um, that issuers think about that because I think it does help um, structure the disclosure, the um, information that investors are interested and investment managers are interested in. Um, so it was, it was, it was work, but it was helpful. Caroline, parting comments. Now that you've heard everyone, your thoughts. Apart from saying green tea bill, <laughs> I'm going to say that again, and I'm going to draw on what Karen has just said actually about increasing the visibility of certification and the proliferation of standards. Uh, who better to do that than the U.S. Treasury? So now I'm not only asking for a green tea. I'm asking for Climate Bond Certified Quality Assured Green Tea, please. Whoa. Okay, we'll see how we go on that one. <laughs> uh, Stephen, party comments for the rest of the world. I think, you know, all of the work, you know, obviously that's being done in the market, you know, led, you know, by groups such as yourself, Sean, and, and, and your strong advocacy for, you know, almost two decades at this point is really, we're starting to finally see the, the fruits of that, that, that work. Um, you know, it's kind of the overnight success, you know, 20 years later scenario, but the fact that we are able to be in a position to be having these discussions, which are really kind of 2.0 from, from where we were, you know, even just a decade ago, we're starting to get into various, you know, granular details and discussions, which really show the evolution and the maturation of this space. And I think that's really important. And as we continue to, you know, evolve, where education engagement is going to remain is going to remain critical. But we're at least now building off of, you know, a very strong base and a solid base. So hopefully, what we're going to continue to see is a rapid diversification, continued rapid growth of the market, and one that allows the investor to be able to find where they're going to be happy, you know, deploying their capital and all of this 
is going to be viewed through a sustainability lens, which is something that, you know, was hard to, to envision, you know, even just a decade ago. So we've made a lot of progress. And, and I think we've gone past the point of no return, which is fantastic. And now it's a matter of being able to continue to shape the future of this market in a way that is beneficial for, for not just investors, but, but the world at, at large. And I think there's a great opportunity for that to occur. Great comments. Thank you, Aaron. Parting words. I agree. We're we're at a at a great point where we can really start to build scale in this market and move it from niche to mainstream. Mainstream issuers should be able to see the appeal of these sorts of bonds. So issuers, think about converting your entire capital structure to green or SLB debt. If you've got green projects, label them. If that's hard to do due to cost or lack of projects, set sustainability targets, issue an SLB. Um, you can partner with your syndicate contacts and, and investors to hit those goals and scale this market. But along with that, I, I will repeat, I think that we're at a point where we, in order to get that scale, we need to work on the standardization of data. And more transparency, more uniformity of data is going to make analysis of and therefore interest in these structures much more widespread. That's cool. Thank you so much. And John, uh, I just want to say that this conversation has made me think maybe there's a need for some kind of collective statement or collective demand for more from the investment sector. So we might come back to all of you with that. And in fact, uh, we'll ask Elizabeth Vishniskaya, who used to be a former colleague of John Zipzelli, who we've been lucky enough to lure to join us at Climate Bonds to, to, to come back to you. And anyone else on who's listening in, in the audience, if you're on the investor side, contact me. Let's have a conversation about how we can encourage more issuance given the strong demand today. But John, wrap us up. Final thoughts for everyone. Well, I think looking at the clock, uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. The I think the, the theme that everyone's uh, touched on here one way or another is that to grow the market right, we need to improve practices across many domains that have been discussed. And at the end of the day, really what we need is a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. You know, Very often when there's rapid growth in a market, some of the innovation takes place by um, reducing features or reducing debt protection, uh, in, if you're thinking in terms of credit. But in this case, the key to growth of the market, as I said at the outset, is for investors, re retail investors, institutional investors, to have confidence that they're getting what they want to get when they invest in a green bond strategy or a, a ESG strategy. And so race to the top, not a race to the bottom. That's the key to the growth of this market. That's a great way to wrap up this session, I have to say, John. Really fantastic point, for which I, I can see everyone nodding. <laughs> um, we had a, another panellist that was going to join us, Paul O'Connor, who's the one of the global green gurus of JP Morgan. Um, he's unfortunately getting an award from a princess today in, in London. So <laughs> I'm not going to go to the details. He'll tell us in due course. So he couldn't join us. So I just recorded a brief interview with him about a, a view from a banker about all these things. Um, for, folks, you don't need to stay on. We'll cut to the recorded interview. Or you can stay and listen to, if you'd like, technology can be. So I'd like the team now to just shift to Paul uh, for a, just a few, a few short minutes, and then we'll wrap up the day. But thank you so much for joining us today. We'll call this the official end of the panel. Thank you, Caroline, for the work you're doing in research. But, you know, I'm going to say, Karen, thank you for the pioneering issuance where you are already opening up a university market in terms of issuance. And, of course, we're looking forward to you supporting the education of the market in the US. As you say, your voice will be so important. And, Aaron, what can I say? What a journey we've been on. John, so cool to have you with us. And Stephen, man, the first time I shared a panel of him so many years ago, this was tiny, this market. And now we're getting up to $2 trillion. But what we need, everyone, is the US now to come to market at scale. That's how we get the trillion a year, not the $2 trillion outstanding, the largest debt capital market in the world. That's this year's task, I think. Let's cut to Paul and see what he says.
folks you've heard from the investors in the North American panel, I wanted to now just quickly introduce you to a friend of mine, Paul O'Connor, who's one of the green bond gurus of JP Morgan. Because of course, JP Morgan, uh, the biggest bank in the Western world, are doing all of these deals. And what are you seeing on the ground, Paul? I want to ask you first, welcome, Paul, to the session. What are you seeing on the ground in North America? What's happening? Thanks, John. So, I mean, uh, what we're seeing on the ground is an enormous uptick in the level of interest around ESG generally, and in particular, low carbon solutions. So massive, massive focus on the tools and techniques and technologies that we're going to be deploying to achieve economic decarbonization. All of that is going to require a huge amount of financing. And, you know, the U.S. is in, uh, you know, a fantastic position to make use of all of these new technologies and also to find the capital to put behind them. So I think we can look forward to, you know, a very, very appreciable uh, uptick in the volume of ESG labeled debt that's going to be issued to support all of these low carbon transitions. That's a very bullish response, Paul. <laughs> That's great news for the investors who are saying they want to get more green and sustainable bonds. Um, what, what's the work that's got to be done to convert this? Is it pretty straightforward? Are people coming deals or are you finding there's quite a lot of engagement to get people ready for marketing, especially new issuers? So the good news is a lot of it is happening already and the, the debt instruments will effectively be holding up a mirror to what uh, companies in these key industry sectors are doing to evolve their business models in a sort of a low carbon direction. So that's the good news. There's a lot of work to do to scale up and prove these technologies. But what we're seeing is, you know, appetite for the solutions and we're seeing investor interest and expectation that these solutions will come through and investors are willing to put the money and, and support and endorse these, uh, you know, steps that these companies are taking. Do you think that the change, the administration, the infrastructure bill and so on, uh, that's got that's been put through so far will have a material effect on issues and support issuance growth? Is that going to flow through? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the tone has dramatically changed under the new administration. I think the signals uh, are all pointing in the right direction. And I think corporates uh, uh, in the key industry sectors are taking a lot of comfort from, you know, the signals that are being given out under the new administration. So I think everything is pointing in the right direction. And it's just a question of making it happen and getting on with it. And, uh, you know, the finance flows are a big part of making that happen. Boy, sounds good. How can we help? What do you need? to make this huge, or are you just doing it and it's going to sneak up on the rest of us? Yeah, so again, uh, you know, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And a lot of these things are happening already, but they're not necessarily visible in the market. So right. I think one thing that is important is that, you know, government follow up, uh, you know, their statements and their policy signaling, you know, with economic incentives. Things like carbon pricing, for example, are going to play a big role in all of this. And once companies, uh, you know, have some confidence that the economic incentives will evolve in the right direction, I think they'll be willing to uh, put capital behind these solutions that we all need to achieve this decarbonisation that we're looking at. Well, um, we're hearing some very encouraging th signals coming out of the, the White House and the Treasury Secretary's office at the moment. So let's watch this space, I guess. Um, Paul, I need to ask you, we have seen massive growth in the market where it looks like we're going to hit close to about two trillion of green and sustainable bonds outstanding this year, 80% growth. At least that's our report. What's, are, you, are you taking any bits about what growth in the US market's going to be like in this um, next period? Is it going to be 10%, 20% or 120%? I mean, I think, you know, the market already year to date has exceeded our expectations. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of things are driving it. You know, we have new labels and new structures and new ways of doing things. And we also have a, a vastly increased investor appetite for ESG label securities. So, you know, I think we are going to outpace where we were last year. And I think we've already exceeded some of the initial uh, forecasts that were made at the start of this year. So, you know, I think the sky's the limit. You know, the, uh, the costs of doing all this uh work that we're talking about doing you know are appreciable and the level of finance that's needed to be uh, put behind it to make it all happen you know is enormous and a big part of that will be reflected in the growth of the esg debt capital markets so i think you know as i say the sky's the limit there's a lot to do a lot of money to be put to work and uh you know i think that's going to drive the market in the right direction fantastic folks at climate bonds we're very proud to partner with jp morgan 
with Paul, with the rest of the team. You'll see some other conversations with Chukumana and so on during the week because we have an elephant moving. JP Morgan is the elephant of banks. And as you can hear from the conversation today, they are getting going. They are helping deliver the deals that investors are asking for and want. Paul, it's an incredibly exciting time. Two years ago, three years ago, we weren't having this conversation, were we? And so we can feel it in the air. Absolutely. Thank you, thank, thank you for joining us. Good luck. And um, we wish you a lot of success. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. This is the end, the wrap-up. I want to remind you, it's pretty cool agenda tomorrow, too. If you're going to join in, join in tomorrow. We have we start off in the morning with uh, Mary McGuinness, the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Stability, and so on. An interview I've done of her will talk about this common ground taxonomy that we've been supporting the European Commission on uh, with the People's Bank of China and the other side of the equation. In fact, Ma Jun's doing that work, who's also the co-chair of the G Green, the sorry, the G20 uh, Green Finance Sustainable Finance Study Group with US Treasury. Uh, so that's one session. We then have a session on central banks where in emerging markets. We have Paul Bodnar, Global Head of Sustainable Investments for BlackRock, talking. We've got John Morton, who's counsellor to US uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen. So uh, Aaron and, and Steve and Karen, US market is going to be featuring tomorrow again. We have a session on a green window, which is the nature of collaboration between the major economies we might see in coming years to help us shift. You know, the theory is, our theory is, we get China, the US and Europe collaborating on green. Hey, the rest of the world just follows. What's it going to take to make that happen, particularly in green finance? A whole session on resilience and bonds and then a review of the day and what that means for the market. Join us. It's going to be really cool. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to our fantastic panellists from the, in the US market. US is going to be amazing in the next 12 months. Have a good rest of the day.